Good afternoon from uh, Villa Paola, the, the heart of Max Weber program. My name is Gasper, uh, and it's a, a great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome here uh, today the EUI Professor Richard Watmore. Uh, Professor Watmore is an eminent intellectual historian. He is a professor of uh, modern history at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, he's a co-director of the Institute of Intellectual, intellectual History at the same institution. Um, he's a specialist in 18th century political economy, international politics, intellectual culture, uh, but he has also written quite extensively on the uh, craft and transformation of the field of intellectual history. Uh, he has co-edited numerous important essay collections and authored several monographs. Uh, including Against War and Empire, Geneva, Britain and France in the 18th century, and Terrorists, Anarchists and Republicans, uh, the Genevans and the Irish in Time of Revolution, which uh, uh, just came out over a week ago with Princeton University Press. Um, so before giving his lecture tonight, which is entitled The End of Enlightenment and After, uh, Professor Waterman has kindly agreed to a short interview uh, with my colleague Jorge and myself, who have prepared a, a, a set of questions which will hopefully lead us into an interesting conversation. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Walker to tell us a bit more about his new book and uh, how it kind of engages with the current debate. Okay, um, thank you and obviously thanks for, uh, for doing all of this. So I'm, it's wonderful to see this book, as I've already said, because I only have one copy uh, myself, and, um, and the fact that you've got it so quickly is a miracle. Anyway, uh, so it's called Terrorists, Anarchists and Republicans, and the reason that it is called Terrorists, Anarchists and Republicans is that both the Genevans and the Irish in the late 18th century get called Terrorists, Anarchists and Republicans. And, the idea of Genevans being called terrorists, I think, is a kind of fantastic uh, notion uh, because, obviously, uh, the now Swiss, obviously in the 18th century, Genevans are not Swiss, uh, but the, the notion of them uh, wanting to collapse governments and societies and being branded heretics and danger, a danger to society uh, is, was, a, was an interesting one. Um, it tells a story, in, in some ways, many intellectual history books, uh, some of them are thematic, not that many of them are, uh, I suppose, are standard history books. You know, it, it's something that we might want to talk more about, mm -hmm. how far intellectual historians are historians. Obviously, there's often tensions, uh, lots of tensions between them. Uh, but this book tells a story, and it tells a story of the attempt to move the Republic of Geneva to Waterford in Ireland in, well, after the Genevan Revolution, which failed of 1782. In 1782, uh, Geneva is invaded. The popular government, they call themselves Democrats, which is also remarkable in the 18th century. They're kicked out of Geneva and they, they are desperate. They want to reconstitute the state and they're persuaded by... Uh, British, the, well, the British Prime Minister at the time, a man called uh, William Petty, who was all, everybody calls him Lord Shelburne, he persuades them to move to Waterford in Ireland. And before it goes terribly wrong, uh, which uh, it does, um, it, um, a, a remarkable experiment is initiated because the Genevans in question, they're radicals, uh, they're radical republicans, they believe in republicanism as a doctrine, they think that republics are in danger, they want them to, they want them to survive into the future, and they end up becoming Irish subjects of the British crown. Uh, the story goes on because the place where New Geneva was created ends up as a prison for united Irishmen in 1798. So it was a place, New Geneva was created for Republicans and it ends up being the place where Republicans are massacred uh, because it's a huge prison uh, for united Irishmen after the 1798 rebellion. So it tells the Genevan part of the story and it tells the Irish mm -hmm. part of the story. 
and uh, uh, I'm quite pleased. I'm in that, <laughs> I'm in that joyous uh, phase of being pleased uh, with a book. Obviously, it doesn't usually last, but uh, yeah, there's a. Uh, we haven't had a chance to look at it in yeah, yeah, <laughs> detail, yeah. unfortunately, but oh. yeah, we look forward to it. No, developing on, on the tension between the small republics and empires, which is a a mm -hmm. common theme in your in your uh, work, yes. and uh, we wonder how, how important is this rivalry or this tension uh, for the articulation of modern political ideas that were the main feature of late 18th century uh, political yeah. thought. Yeah, I suppose I think that we, especially in intellectual life, we should focus on the end of stories rather than presuming that they go on and on. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think is that 18th century republicanism dies. It, there's, you can draw parallels with subsequent forms of republicanism, but 18th century republicanism, including the Commonwealth, so-called Commonwealth tradition, fails. Uh, at the end of the 18th century. Again, it's it's coming back to the Pocock story and actually an argument that I still have with John Pocock is whether the Machiavellian moment could go to the 1790s and couldn't really go further. Obviously, the Machiavellian moment brilliantly goes into North American history in the, in the 19th century and, and I think I can understand that. Mm -hmm. But for Europe, I think everything changes not in the 1790s, it's really 1770s, 80s and 90s. I think republicanism really comes to an end point. Obviously, let's take the Europe's republics. Every single one except San Marino is eaten up, transformed, ripped apart, reconstituted during this period. So I'm also very, very sceptical of people who think that the function of history is to draw parallels between past and present. So I think, and I'm, I've written about this a, a little bit in the past, but the notion of passing on a kind of baton called human rights to the next runner or democracy or civil liberty or liberalism from one runner to another, and you're always searching for the origin and searching for the origin. I actually think it's bad history, mm -hmm. and I really don't like the approaches to the 18th century, particularly where there's this endless search for what are the origins of human rights, what are the origins of liberalism, what are the origins of whatever modern value we can see existed in the 18th century. And obviously, you end up becoming a kind of critic of history, uh, because you end up saying, oh, well, they were not fully Democrats or they were not fully in favour of gender equality mm -hmm. or their notion of rights wasn't as broad as it ought to have been. And, and I'm, I always think if you, the role of the historian, including the intellectual historian, is to work out what they thought and put yourself in their time and don't presume that there are necessary continuities. So actually, uh, I think that uh, it's very hard to draw parallels. You can say a lot of the problems are the same with the 18th century, because uh, they were facing catastrophe. They believe they were facing catastrophe in the same way that we are. But, uh, but I, yeah, I don't like the origin stuff. Yeah, I, I, so, I, I, and I'll give you examples. So, you know, Jonathan Israel, Dan Edelstein, mm -hmm. Steve Pincus searching for the origins of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I don't mind. No, no, I have to say that I absolutely agree <laughs> with, uh, with your vision. <laughs> and before moving on into the intellectual historian's craft, per se, I wanted just to ask if there were differences in the way these small republics in Europe resisted to the imperial uh, pushing, uh, depending on different cultural, religious, or intellectual economic backgrounds, or there was a, a common response, or there were various responses, depending on the context? Um, well, I think that, I think that uh, David Hume uh, was absolutely right when he said that the world changed in the 16, around the 1680s when commerce became a reason of state. Mm. And what that means is that 
states begin to want to take over other states' markets. Now, why do you want to do that? You want to do that because military technology is suddenly very expensive and you have very big mercenary armies and you've got to pay for them. And taxing commercial products is one way of doing it. Having a vast market yourself, there's a, there's a turn to empire uh, at the end of the 17th century. And that meant that all of the commercial republics, because it's obviously, you know, republics are commercial. They always have been commercial, but they, it meant that they were able to be commercial because they could specialise or they undertook certain functions because of their geographical location, obviously, you know, transporting people for the Crusades uh, or, uh, or producing watches for the world. Um, and they were allowed to exist. But in the 18th century, the big states... They want to take the small states. They don't want to allow them to economically specialise anymore. So there's a crisis for the small for the small republics of every kind, and the smaller states per se. You know, I mean, and, and obviously smaller states by smaller, it's really do you ha can you sustain an empire? So you'd even say that a small state, even though geographically it's huge, Poland, Lithuania, you know, so. If, because it can't sustain an empire. So in the states that can't sustain empires are, uh, are in trouble and they're eaten up. You know, the 18th century, I think one of the big mistakes about the 18th century is that people think of it as the boring century between the wars of religion and the nationalist <laughs> wars of the 19th century. Whereas actually, they think in the 18th century, which is one thing I'm gonna say in the lecture a bit later, is that they think catastrophe is round the corner. They think that they're living through a period where what exists in the present cannot last into the future. So there's all this speculation about alternative futures and the transition mechanisms by which you go from what exists to what you would like to exist. And um, uh, that's why it's, it's, an, it's very, very exciting intellectually because everything is, is changing. One of the things that's changing is the notion of maintaining a republic. And let's face it, you know, there's a very, very long tradition of how do you maintain your state, how do you maintain your republic? And all of the traditional answers are gone in the 18th century. So they're innovating. And the irony is that, you know, we have endless amounts of scholarship on republicanism and, you know, a European story, a shared European heritage. Uh, it probably was a shared European heritage, but it ends in the 18th century. It really does because they they are they hit the buffers, and they cannot maintain themselves. And actually, if you you know, let's take some of like Adam Smith. Adam Smith famously says that he's living in a time where there is a rage for monarchy. You know, a rage for monarchy. Monarchy is the dominant form. It's not republic. Republics are all in decline. So I've always found it kind of ironic. This you know, republican tradition, republican tradition. Uh, and, and I suppose linkages between republican ideas and communitarianism today or something like that, because they're just, they're very, very, they're just different. And the republican tradition, as I've claimed, ends. And, and ends dreadfully, you know, and eaten what, up by the French Republic. And what we have in the 19th century is a new narrative and a new, after the, the, the end of this republicanism. Yeah, well, I think it's a different kind of republicanism, yeah. because the model, yeah. what, what, is one of the very interesting things about the end of the 18th century is that people speculate about what's the future of republics. And some very interesting people, such as Jean-Louis Delorme, who wrote obviously the most popular book on the English constitution, published in 1771 in French. He produces an English version. And it's, it's, a, it's very, very popular. There's endless numbers of editions. Delon is Genevan. He's a Republican. He speculates about how to maintain republics in this monarchical world. And what does he say? Ultimately, he says, they have to become like England. There's no point having a standard republic. The old small states don't work anymore. You've got to follow the English constitution. But the interesting thing he then says, is that it can't be an English constitution within a British empire. The British have to get rid of their empire 
in order for the constitution to be to maintain liberty, to be for it to exist in a free state. In some ways, you know, somebody who was fascinated by Jean Louis Delon was John Adams. John Adams' version of the North American Constitution, ultimately, you know, in the 1780s and after, when he's writing his history of republics before he becomes president, he says, "We've got to model ourselves on the British." That is a transformation in political ideas because everybody pretty much in the 18th century thinks that Britain as a state is doomed. It's the huge difference between the 18th and the 19th century uh, for me. And you know, people say, some people would reply and say, oh, but Voltaire thought the English constitution was marvelous. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, in the letters on England he does, but later on he thinks it's an absolute disaster. Montesquieu in the 11th book of the Spirit of the Laws thinks it's the freest state in history. He doesn't think it's going to last. That's the point. Can you maintain your state? And people don't think that Britain can be maintained. In the 19th century, everything changes. Well, uh, that's another, another story. <laughs> well, perhaps we can actually um, talk a bit of more about that and kind of this is a kind of follow up question that kind of ties a few things together. I think kind of the end of a certain kind of republicanism and the, um, the, the triumph, if you want, of this monarchical. Uh, world is, is um, the question will be how the concept of an empire changes pre and mm -hmm. post uh, French uh, Revolution, is there, and how does that maybe also shapes our, our ideas today about the empire? Um, I think that uh, there's lots of different versions of empire. You know, there always has been. Oh, the big question being how centralized should an empire be, uh, and, and obviously, you know, French versions, Dutch versions, Portuguese versions, Roman versions, Greek versions, Holy Roman Empire versions, if you want to call it, obviously an empire, there's, there's lots of different variants. What I think is very interesting is again the British model. And the reason that the British model is interesting is because from being a state that very, very few people would have said it's stable, we ought to follow it or model ourselves on its structure. Um, over a relatively short period of time, it becomes a model state. I mean, uh, there are people who live through the French Revolution, who are French revolutionary republicans, die-hard republicans, and come out the other end saying, actually, we should have just followed the British model. Now, the problem with the British model has always been that it's a mercantile system. Now, a mercantile system is defined by Adam Smith as being a corrupt uh, nexus between politicians, bankers and merchants, which really prevents the public good from being followed. So Smith, in The Wealth of Nations, thought that the thing that he was doing more than anything else was condemning British the British Empire. Now, lots and lots of people were of Smith's view. Smith is taken up by radical after radical because they thought he'd provided them with the, a way of describing the disaster that was Britain's empire. Now, for Britain, still with its empire, to then become a model in the, in the early 19th century, it's, it's really peculiar. And the question is, how did it happen? Now, the critique of the empire, in Smith's case, and in pretty much all the critiques, you focus on Ireland and you focus on India. Because where are the British monsters, Ireland and India? Where are they seen to be positive? And this is actually, it's a complicated story, but the positive thing people say about the British empire is that it's an empire in itself. So thinking of the British Constitution, it is a monarchy, but it's a monarchy with a federal structure, and Scotland joins the empire. And it's the Scottish Union that is the lesson to follow. Obviously, that's ironic today, because Scottish <laughs> nationalists say it's been a disaster since 1707. <laughs> Obviously, since they, uh, the Darien scheme yeah. and the Isthmus of Panama failed. I mean, you know, lowland Scotland's bankrupt. 
uh, the union made sense. The union was, from the perspective of lots and lots of 18th century writers, was a huge triumph. And the reason it was a triumph is that in most empires, if you've got a, a big powerful state and you've got a weaker state and they're joined together, the dominant state makes a mess of the smaller state, the weaker state. And obviously lots of people predicted that about the Scottish case. But Scottish culture thrives, it has a separate uh, legal system and laws. It has its universities that rise to prominence in Europe in the 18th century. Economically it's transformed. So the Scottish model of union within the British Empire is parroted and is accepted as being proof that Britain is a cosmopolitan empire. Now, calling Britain a cosmopolitan empire is, is in some ways a funny thing. And, and actually, a, a student of mine who is Korean uh, once said to me, because uh, I, I did call Britain a cosmopolitan empire in, in, in the book uh, Against War and Empire, and he said, your book will never be taken seriously in Korea because there is no such thing as a cosmopolitan empire. You know, the Koreans know that every empire is dominates the smaller, weaker power. You know, the Scots know it, the Koreans know it, anybody, the Indians know it, the Irish know it, anybody who is dominated knows that about empire. So for you to say that, it, it, it offends Korean sensibilities. <laughs> now, obviously, my response is, as an intellectual historian, it is a fact that the Scots do very, very well in the 18th century, and they're seen to be the model. And what is fascinating to me which not a lot of people know, is that when the Genevans go to the Congress of Vienna in 1814, and obviously Geneva hasn't been an independent republic since 1798 because it's annexed to France in that, in that year, their representatives go to, uh, go to Vienna and they say to the big powers, turn us into Scotland. So Geneva becomes Scotland within Switzerland as a canton. So Geneva becomes a canton in 1815, and the idea that they have in mind is, we keep Genevan culture, we keep Genevan laws, we keep, that means the national identity, your sense of being a Genevan, but you're part of this bigger whole that treats us equally. That, that's the model, that is the Scottish example. Obviously the counter example, is the Irish case when there's the Union in 1800, 1801. What do the British not do? They do not grant the Irish Catholic emancipation, and that is a complete disaster because it means the Irish are not given the, the rights, the civil rights that are enjoyed by, by uh, British subjects, and that's, that means it's a, it's a complete, it's a counter-argument. So the British Empire exists. I would say there's, it becomes a model because of Scotland. That's why, you know, why would anybody read the books of Walter Scott? I don't know whether you've read Walter Scott. They're, they're tough. Them, yeah. They're tough. <laughs> you know, why are they a literary sensation yes. in the early decades of the 19th century? Because people are obsessed with Scottish history. Mm -hmm. They want to know, this is an empire that works. This is a small, weak state with not that much natural resources, but a lot of, in a lot of potential. Look at it. Look at it, it's absolutely thriving. Mm -hmm. where, where would Protestants want to send their children to be educated? Mm -hmm. Obviously it used to be Leiden, Utrecht. They send them to Glasgow, to Edinburgh, to Aberdeen. Unfortunately St Andrews remains a backwater uh, in the 18th century. Um, it's, uh, it's not one of the, the top ones where people send their, send their children. But that's, that just shows the power of the, the, power of the union. Mm -hmm. I suppose. Uh, that's very uh, interesting indeed. And I, I was just wondering whether, to, to, to what extent, um, the, the kind of um, historical memory of British Empire as this model state influences uh, um, certain discourses, ideas currently in, in Britain about the, their 19th century past and about nostalgia, yeah. more or less nostalgia about that past. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a different story, but yeah, personally, absolutely. what I think the, the different story, you know, I, I love uh, Macaulay and uh, uh, 
the lays of ancient Rome, which really present the history of Rome, and Romans are Englishmen, and you know that's that's a nineteenth-century story. The notion of British national character and confidence, you know, the British being Romans, obviously, especially the English being Romans, that's something that's invented in the nineteenth century, and it's remarkable that if you always, if you suddenly assume that a state that has been a complete mess. A century before is suddenly the model of stability. How do you manage it? There's a, there's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Is it relevant today? Unfortunately, it's not relevant at all because Britain is going through exactly the same process as so many states before it have gone through, which is you're a big empire and now you're a small, puny, irrelevant, small state. And the politics usually politics go mad during that period. You know, you've had international respect or your diplomats have seen themselves as, as being significant. Your, your populace has seen, seen themselves as having, you know, a glorious past. And all of a sudden, you're not in that position anymore. Politics becomes farcical, you know, and I think Brexit and, but even before Brexit, uh, the notion of Britain's place in the world, the adjustment from being a big, powerful state to being a, a, a small, relatively weak state, it's, uh, it's, um, it's happened over and over, and it's happening to the British. And unfortunately, you know, democratic politics in part tends not to be honest because you can't tell the people the truth because uh, you're presenting a an image to them that is uh, complicated and frightening. So, so that that's not acknowledged. Of course, it would be better if it was if it, if it was uh, acknowledged. Obviously, the way Britain has got round it is by identification with the United States. Obviously, Tony Blair doing that. I think it would have been better if Blair had been honest and said, "We need to invest in the future and prepare for." small state status, mm -hmm. but the British still have fantasies of, you know, obviously Boris Johnson, one of the most embarrassing things I've ever heard is the let the lion roar. I mean, hearing a politician say that, and obviously what does it mean? Oh, you know, we could be an empire again. You know, I'm sure the New Zealanders and the Australians and all of the, the members of the empire, you know, perhaps even India itself, they'll jump they'll jump in again. I, I find it really, really embarrassing. Obviously, he knows it's, it's embarrassing. embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, it's not it, possible. It, it's perhaps a bit ironic, isn't it, that yeah, as, a, as, a state, as, a, as an empire, as a state who, who, who kind of managed that big, small state uh, uh, argument problem, right, mm -hmm. kind of now isn't able to, to learn that lesson Absolutely. itself, basically, isn't that? <laughs> Absolutely, which comes back to my point yeah. about stories ending. Mm -hmm. You know, which is something that I, I am really interested in. And so it's not passed on to the next generation. You don't learn mm -hmm. yeah. from it. Absolutely. And, uh, and actually that's why treating the past in a particular way yeah. and reconstituting, I suppose, the lost discourses and arguments is the task of the historian because then you genuinely can have a kind of comparative mm -hmm. perspective rather than assuming it's this glorious rise of rights, rise of democracy, rise of liberalism, whatever. Mm. So, mm -hmm. what leaders I think to the role of the craft of the historian, intellectual historian. Um, I mean, if you want... To I mean, I, yeah, I, exactly. I have so. a question that kind of relates mm. to that that I wanted to, um, to ask now, which is, you know, in, in, your, in your book, What is Intellectual History, you say, if I may quote, uh, um, it's a nice quote. <laughs> the history of ideas or intellectual history tends to flourish in times of uncertainty about the future and where people are seeking alternatives to skepticism, cynicism and utopian schemes for the end of history or the construction of near perfect societies. So mm -hmm. when we were reading this we were wondering, is now a good time for intellectual uh, history? What do you think? I think it is, but I think it's, it's hard as well because uh, there's, from my point of view, and it could be argued against, I'm sure, I think there's been a turn against history. Uh, politicians, 
I mean, obviously, we don't want to mention Trump because he's an outlier. <laughs> but I think uh, the lack of knowledge, I mean, partly it's the, it's the nationalistic turn, of course. Um, wanting to learn national histories, there was a proposal in Britain by a politician called Michael Gove, who's obviously a, a prominent minister, is now the minister responsible for Brexit post Boris Johnson, and he wanted Britain's glorious story being told, a story of empire in the schools. And that uh, is really, for me, it's anti-history, because it, it's not understanding the complexity and the and the cul-de-sacs and the, and the failures, as well as the, you know, whatever people perceive to be uh, glorious, such as the Scottish Union. Obviously, you know, glorious Scottish Union isn't going to play well in Scotland uh, these days if you are a, a nationalist. So, um, so there's, I think there's been a turn against it. And I, and I think it's the other problem for intellectual history, which is especially marked at present, is that... Um, no question the majority of philosophers or, or prominent figures yes there are, there are lots of women um, but it's men it's dead white men and the elite in society often uh, some of them are not but so a lot of them are uh, justifying uh, notions that people might find abhorrent and obviously, uh, there's a there's a somebody who I'm very interested in is one of the American founding fathers, and he's a he's a British subject, but he ends up living in in North America. He's called Benjamin Vaughan, and his family are Jamaican planters. And for the first part, the first decades of his life, Vaughan, who has run a plantation, is pro-slavery. Now he's pro-slavery because he thinks that. If you abolish slavery overnight, which in an ideal world he'd like to do, he thinks it would be worse for the slaves. And that you have to focus on a, a really, really precise transition mechanism to when you move from a state of slavery to a state of liberty. Saying, actually, slavery's bad, liberty's good, let's free everybody overnight, he thought was crazy and would be self-defeating. Now, I can explain it, and it's fascinating. You know, Vaughan's justifications of maintaining slavery for over a particular period, it's, it's, it's thought out from, by somebody who had a first-hand experience. Now, in, our, in a public culture where things are black and white, especially nationalist cultures, the nationalists turn again, black and white values, are you pro-democracy, are you anti-democracy? I, I think that's hard as well. Ideas, what intellectual history has done, I think, is a discipline which everybody should be very proud of, who's been lucky enough to kind of work in the field, is to appreciate how complicated ideas are in the past. And the closer that we get to the, the complete nature of a human being's argument about a subject that they knew about, that's an achievement. And, I, and anybody who does that, is, it's very, very, it's important work. Is it likely to be appreciated? No. One of my worries, it's a genuine worry, you know, I have students, who say, uh, where's the women? You know, we want, we want to be, we want 50-50 men and women in the syllabus and in terms of writings. Uh, I think that's an interesting one. Uh, it's gonna be difficult. I understand where they're coming from because they want to, they want to work out the origins of our world. I think the search for origins is often problematic, but you, you gain from reconstituting alien uh, stories and an alien past. And, and if you do that, you get a lot out of it. So obviously I just have to become better at 
at making the case. So that's that's worrying. I mean, again, the point about can you study empire in places where empire has done real damage, uh, and, and obviously mentioning Korea, does it mean you shouldn't study empire in places like that? I would say, well, actually, you know, the British case is quite an interesting one. So is the French case. So you should. It, it's worth uh, it's worth reconstituting. Yeah, and thinking about this, the, how complicated ideas mm -hmm. are in the societies of the past. They are, uh, how complicated these ideas are nowadays, and how complicated they were in the past. Um, again, in your in your in your work, you have um, uh, you have uh, reflect on uh, ideas and social forces and how powerful can ideas be and how they can have an impact and influence in societies of the past, obviously, but uh, assuming the complicated, how complicated it is to develop an idea, to have ideas as socially constructed. Yeah. Uh, the question is, no, 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 the question is how, how ideas are powerful, how can they be social forces, and there are some examples in historical uh, times, historical societies. Yeah, see, I'm fascinated and I did think you'd ask the question. Uh, I'm fascinated by uh, people in very, very difficult circumstances, often in circumstances that they perceive to be ones where their options are very, very narrow, so they're conditions of necessity. And everybody knows, you know, the old Roman maxim, necessitas non habet legem, you know, necessity knows no law. You know, law breaks down, mm you're in circumstances of crisis. If you're in circumstances of crisis, what do you do? You work out solutions to the problems that you've got. Now, what's an example of, a, of, a, of, a, of being in that situation? It's the history of Geneva. You know, one of the reasons why I've been so interested in the history of Geneva, and it's not something that people associate with the history of Geneva because of contemporary Geneva, uh, but Geneva was about to be blown up in, in, at the end of June 1782 because they decided that they'd had a popular government and they wanted to maintain that government and the people were happy, but they couldn't convince the French, the big powers, the French and the canton of Bern and Savoy with Savoy, traditionally the enemy of the, of the Genevans, they couldn't persuade them to allow the Republic to maintain itself because they were worried about having a, a terrorist state on their borders, a democracy, and the ideas might spread. So what did the Genevan rebels, though, even though they're democratically elected, uh, they decide to blow up the state. So they fix the walls, they... Um, put gunpowder in the houses of the people they call aristocrats, the magistrates of the city who live in the upper town, and they put gunpowder in the cathedral of, uh, of Saint-Pierre. And they think that because they know that the French have really good cannon and mortar, when they, and, the, and the, some of these uh, are uh, erected on Voltaire's land, and Voltaire is completely happy about it. <laughs> and uh, there's going to be a huge explosion. And the reason that they do that, and the entire populace is, is happy about this, they think there needs to be an example of republican martyrdom for to show the world that republics are, are in their death throes. And unless we go through that process, republics are not going to survive into the future. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, they have to work out what to do. And actually, ironically, the leaders decide at the very last moment to run away. Uh, although running away, they think, that's why they end up in Waterford, uh, in Ireland, because they think republics are dead, but you can have republics within monarchies. And that's their new idea. You know, let's have a republic in a monarchy. Why? We need to be protected by a a bigger power. We can't exist on our own. And intellectually, they have to justify it. They've got access, funnily enough, these the Genevans that I'm particularly interested in, they've got access to Rousseau's manuscripts because 
they were they were obviously they were they were associated with Russo in the seventeen sixties. That that parents were involved with Russo in several cases were friends of Russo's and one of them produces the Geneva edition of Russo's works that comes out in the early 1780s now which includes the confessions and, and some of the some of the works that have remained in manuscript after Russo's death now they know Rousseau they have access to all of his correspondence and it's the correspondence that they're really interested in it's because they think it's in the correspondence. When you wrote to Rousseau and said, we've got a real problem, how should we behave in politics? And Rousseau writes a big letter back. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's really precise. You wouldn't get it from the social contract. You wouldn't even get it, you get it more from the discourse on Poland or the work on Corsica, it's slightly more precise. But actually it's in the, it's in the letters and these letters are sent passed from person to person, they're discussed, they write back, will you refine, you know, what would you do? Obviously, Rousseau says, there isn't the solution. You've just got to get on your knees and beg the French not to destroy you. Now, for one of the greatest philosophers who's ever lived to say there's not a solution to the problem of small states, that's why the Genevans, when they want to be really rude about Rousseau, they said, he loves peace more than liberty. And that's the conclusion that they come to. You know, Rousseau, you know, man is born free but everywhere is in chains. That notion of Rousseau, they, have a, they don't think that's Rousseau. They think there's a, there's a much more specific Rousseau who engaged with particular policies and debated them with us, and we know what the conclusion was that he came to, mm. which was, you're going to fail, you're going to be destroyed. And he was dead right because the French invade and they're about to blow up the city. Mm. So... I see ideas on a day-to-day -day basis as the thing that, in, that gets us to do what we do. So it's not so much that an idea is a social force, it's just how humans behave mm -hmm. if they're faced, especially in conditions of political necessity. I'm not saying people you know, don't adhere to certain cultures, follow the laws, adhere to the, you know, the rules that are set by particular institutions. But actually, if you, if you look at kind of what I like to do, which is really f what you might call, let's say, call it fine-grained, I don't know why I'm using a woodwork analogy, <laughs> but let's say fine-grained intellectual history. I like getting all the correspondence out, you've got the base texts, you know, you've read Rousseau's classic works, you know what he said there, you're in contact with him and you say, you're an extremely clever person, tell us how to behave. And they develop their own policies while engaging, and then they go their own way. Mm. And that's how I see so much of the 18th century, and that's why I love the 18th century so much, because if you think that the world that you live in will not last, then you have to start thinking about what the future is going to be and you have to try and work out how you could get yourself to an alternative future. Now, that is the parallel with the present, because all of us think, because of climate change, nationalism, dreadful politicians, for whatever reason, you know, economic ups and downs, crises, we don't think that the future that we, that the life that we've got now can last. And at the moment, what are we doing? We're speculating about how we can plot for an alternative future. That is the 18th century, right? That's why the 18th century is fascinating to me. Obviously, it's not climate change. It's a different kind of political crisis. It's different political issues, but that is the parallel. And that's why it's as important as it is. Our last question was going to be about what's how to define the craft of the intellectual history in the 21st century, but I think we had a brilliant example just about now. I mean, the, the whole uh, explanation of how ideas work in history and how they can be connected or having parallels with different contexts. And I think. Uh, no, absolutely. I just, I just wanted to, to, to add a comment that I, I thought that we were discussing, when we were kind of reading your work and discussing, you know, what, mm. what is interesting or, or, or different about how you approach intellectual history and 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 I and I thought that that was that was one of the one of the interesting things that I found was that you kind of 
read obviously all these uh, big minds, but always in that particular con always it's not just the arguments in abstract that matter, mm -hmm. but concrete links to particular issues or events in, mm -hmm. uh, and how they they relate. Yeah, I mean it, it's it is it's not for everybody, and sometimes I get I don't get frustrated. Um, it's just a different way of doing things. So one of the games, what, what's the, a big game that intellectual historians play? A big game is, where's Hobbes? Right? <laughs> Everybody says, where's Hobbes? Everybody must have been reading Hobbes, mm -hmm. using Hobbes, relying on Hobbes, have been influenced by Hobbes. Now, uh, it's true in some ways, but it's so indirect and it's such an invented Hobbes. And... Obviously, personally speaking, I think we have different identities for different audiences, for we play different roles, and the, the roles that I'm particularly interested in historically are ones where you're faced with political crisis, and you think your world is going to be destroyed. And in that world, who do you turn to? You know, you look for the experts. And that's why one of the things that I do emphasise a lot is, which I've already said, so I'm repeating myself, is, is letters. Because I think you really understand an author if you get access to their correspondence. Now obviously I've, we were talking earlier and I've said, you know, one of the projects that we have at St Andrews is collecting the correspondence of John Pocock. And that... And, and I collect the correspondence of intellectual historians and the papers of intellectual historians. And actually, in some cases, we have the emails of intellectual historians, which we've never gone through. That's, you know, talk about challenges for the future. Things like that are, are, are very, very complicated. It's going to be, you know, you don't want private information. Actually, in, in the cases where we have got uh, databases of emails, the, we've had people go through and take any private uh, out. But the discussions, that's where debates go. You know, a student says to you, you know, I've read a certain author in a particular way, but I know that this was a particular problem and, and somebody responded to them in this letter. What does it mean? How can we understand it? And you, and you start a debate. And, and that, to me, is the, is the really important stuff. So actually, it's, it's databases like the Electronic Enlightenment that I think are so important. And obviously, we've got it between Hobbes and Bentham, you know, that's what the electronic enlightenment is. And, and you know, certain scholars, early modern scholars, talk about oceans of correspondence. You know, you'll get to the point of having oceans of correspondence and being able to work it. And obviously, in Rousseau's case, I've been very, very lucky because of the work of Ralph Lee, the, you know, the, the endless volumes of Rousseau's correspondence, where he doesn't just produce Rousseau's correspondence, he tries to put, oh, who was he writing to, what's the debate, what were they debating between themselves, and why did they approach Rousseau in the first place? That's just extraordinary scholarship. And, and I think that allows people like me to pontificate about the past, because somebody's done a lot of archival slogging. Obviously, yeah, I, I go to archives, I read uh, letters, I, and I collect them for the future. I hope, you know, that people into the future will continue to be interested in the letters of intellectual historians. It won't be my letters, but I think there'll be, there aren't that many of them, they're too dull. But it will be, you know, the, the, the letters, certainly somebody like John Pocock, I think, could just show you how he himself worked and how did he work. He has an idea about the past, he writes to his friends, he gets feedback, he engages, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a dialogue, and then he comes to a conclusion and he writes a chapter or a paragraph or whatever. That's how the process goes on um, for all of us. So we're all kind of miniature intellectual historians in our, uh, in our lives. Oh, thank you. I think thank that you. Was, <laughs> this is a wonderful <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> to a, a very interesting debate. The last one has anything else to add? No, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank Thanks.